Today, we're talking all about release conditions. What are they? How do they affect your criminal case? Stay tuned. This is attorney Andy Markintel and attorney Mark J. Victor. We are the partners at the Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm here today with our next installment in Fighting the State. How are you doing today, Mark? Good. I'm excited to get started on this one because, as people can probably tell from watching these videos, we just love to talk about this These stuff. are my favorite videos. Yeah, and I don't even know how we're going to get started, what we're going to say. I mean, I got a few notes here about some things, but for the most part, this is just us yakking about... Release conditions. It's another day at the office for us, frankly, because as part of our role as criminal defense attorneys, when people come in and meet with us and consult with us, and you know, a lot of times people are coming in, it's the heaviest thing they've ever had to deal with in their life. Yeah. They're being charged with a crime. Maybe they're looking at a felony. Maybe they're looking at prison time. Uh, you and I often have the role of educator. We have to tell people, the vast majority of whom, by the way, have never had any interaction with the criminal justice system. We have to sit down and kind of break these things down to them and explain explain to them. We have to kind of be the professor in the law office sometimes and explain to them, here's what you're looking at, here's what the process looks at. And so that's why we're doing this series. I love this. Yeah, I mean, even though we know exactly how this works, and I mean, I can't even imagine how many of these hearings that I've done over the years, I think it's comforting for people to just understand, right? So they understand, like, what kind of hearing is this? What is it that's going to be important for the judge to hear? What's going to affect the judge's decision one way or another? If you are released, what kinds of restrictions might you have on you? Like, what is it we're fighting for? How does it normally work? And part of the process is just educating people about how this works. So that's what this video is about today. So I'm excited to get to it. Yeah. Um, I think to kind of set the stage for this video and what's, what it's all about, our staff had us break up this video into maybe 10 different parts. That's right. This is maybe part three or something like that. Um, but we want to kind of break it up even further than that into kind of the microcosm, which is uh, I remember a long time ago when I was uh, fresh out of law school and talking to you about a criminal case. I like the way that you framed a criminal case into three different parts. Uh, I had never heard it broken down like that, either in law school or to any mm. of the other law firms that I had worked for. And it really made it click for me. You want to uh, talk uh, what you mean by a case kind of comes in three different parts? Yeah. And, you know, this is just the way I think about it, just from representing people for over 30 years now. You know, what you might call step one or phase one is really, as I like to say to people, where you're going to be while we're working on the other two That's steps right. or phases. And this is the thing usually people care about the most, especially at the beginning, right? Because if you're arrested and you're hauled off to jail, I know, we know already what's in your head. Like, get me out of this place. Right. And so that's really the first part. And this is really, it sets up the case, right? Because if our client is going to be stuck in a jail cell while this case is pending, they're going to want to get it done a lot faster. Mm -hmm. It's going to put a lot more pressure on us to get this thing resolved one way or another. Because every time we continue the case 30 days, they're going to be like, ah, oh, another 30 day wait. So if we can get our client out of custody, it takes all of that pressure off the case. And that's important because, you know, sometimes it, it just takes time, right? I mean, we want to get an expert involved. The experts got to review the case. Their schedule is busy. They may be looking for an extra piece of evidence that we don't have. We're waiting on the state to get that to us. And we can't get an opinion from the expert until the expert gets that piece of information. And we want to use the expert's report for something. If they're out of custody, I mean, even though people will still want to get the, th the whole mess behind them, right? Because Oftentimes, it will be the most stressful thing that ever faced in their entire lives. But it's far less pressure if they're out and they're, you know, they're at their home and sleeping in their bed and eating food out of their own refrigerator rather than in a cage. So yeah, alleviating that pressure yeah. for clients well, is so important, not only for them, but for their criminal defense attorneys. When you hire a competent criminal defense attorney, you don't just go with a public defender or some bargain basement lawyer. When you get a good defense attorney, the purpose of hiring that person is not to just hire somebody to do as little work as possible, hold your hand 
and walk you into court to take the very first plea that the state offers. No, the reason for hiring a firm like ours is because you want the case done right. You want us to take our time, go through all the evidence, go through everything with a fine tooth comb, file all the motions that need to be filed, fight every issue that needs to be fought. And it's so much easier to do that when we don't have that pressure coming from our client who understandably doesn't want to be in custody at the time. Yeah, the other thing that's good about it is, especially if somebody has engaged our law firm and they're really not that familiar with our firm, right? Oftentimes people are referred to our law firm from somebody else. Might be another lawyer, another person out in the community. Hey, try these guys out. So, you know, maybe they're not 100% sure. And this is a real emergency situation, right? Usually the call is the wife, the girlfriend, the brother, someone like that. Hey, uh, my loved one has been picked up and is now in jail. So it gives us an opportunity to really show what we're about at the beginning of the case. We can get involved quickly, uh, move fast. Again, you know, this is part of the reason why we really want people in the AOR program to fill out that emergency contact form because it just, it makes our job easier, right? Instead of scrambling around to get all this information, imagine asking the girlfriend, you know, how how long has he lived in the community? I I guess I don't know. know, Or what are his ties? What are these kinds of things? It gives us so much information if they fill out that form ahead of time that we can use that's relevant to step one, ways that we can get them out of custody, arguments we can make to the judge. So if you're an AOR client and you haven't filled out your uh, information form that gives us your emergency contacts and everything on your portal, go fill that stuff out. It's not just for show. It's not just for fun. It's incredibly legally relevant and it helps us do our job. Yeah. And the other thing I like about it too, it's, it's our first skirmish with the prosecutor. And look, in Arizona, if you're a prosecutor and you don't know our law firm, you're probably brand new. And so they see a notice of appearance, attorneys for freedom, like they know what they're dealing with. But especially if it's an out-of-state case and uh, maybe they're not so familiar with us, it gives us a great opportunity to get in there and really bring it really big. Really show them on the yeah. very first interaction. Yeah, we, gotta, we, we wanna, bring it big. We want to serve notice to this prosecutor right at the beginning that we're going to fight this case. This isn't one of these where it's just going to be kind of a lay down or we're going to walk through or we're going to take a quick plea or something like that. You got a team on the other side that's going to fight every Every aspect of this case. Also, it's great to just for appearances, right? It's nice when you show up at two o'clock in the morning. You've done this. I've done this. And not only are you in a suit with a jacket and your shoes are shined and ready to go, you've got a grasp of the case, right? You know who your client is. You know the best arguments. And if they were paying attention in the pre-charge section, we may have a motion to set release conditions ready to go. I mean, this is a hearing. This where, makes a statement. Yeah. Almost never does a defense attorney show up, right? There's not a, almost never a public defender there. Usually there's not a private attorney ready to go. And all of a sudden here comes this case and there's a lawyer who's completely prepared, showing up, dressed to the T, looking like a lawyer, ready for battle, acknowledging all the facts in the case. And uh, you know that's the kind of thing a prosecutor notices. This is going to be a hard-fought case. So before we get into the step one, real quick, we're not going to get into the details today. We're going to save that for future uh, episodes. But do you want to at least mention what? Because we've talked about how it's a three-part case. You know, three yes, parts yes, to a case. Yes. Number one is where are you going to be while the case is pending? That's what we're talking and about then, today. But what's part two? And yeah. Three? So that gets resolved, right? You're either in custody and the bond isn't going to be posted, or you're out of custody. You got conditions. As long as you follow those, you'll stay out of custody the whole time. And we'll loop back and talk about some of those conditions. But then we move into step two or phase two, which is what we call the guilt phase. And we're going to do a series of videos on the guilt phase. This is the question of, are you going to be guilty of something? And if so, What? Because it's really common that, you know, you may have one charge that's a a very serious charge and then sometimes that'll be reduced down to a lower charge. Okay, so that's what step two or phase two is about the guilt phase. There's an awful lot that goes into that. That could go for a year or more sometimes, depending on the case. And then if it's indeed going to come out that you are guilty of something, then you move to step three or phase three, which is now the sentencing phase. Sometimes people over 
overlook this and they don't really think that, okay, now we're on the downward, we've taken a plea and you're just going to go into a quick sentencing. And they might think that because they've maybe watched a lot of these. And if you go to court, people who aren't familiar with this, just go to your local court on what we call law in motion day, where they're doing changes of pleas, they're doing release hearings, they're doing sentencing. The average sentencing's probably five to 10 minutes long, right? The prosecutor gets up there and says, yes, judge, he's the worst guy ever, here's why. Uh, the defense attorney gets up and says, oh, he's a, he's a good boy and he's never gonna do this again and he feels bad. And then the defendant stands up and says, yes, I've learned my lesson, I have a lot of remorse, I feel terrible. And then the judge pronounces sentencing and everybody's done. That's not how we do phase three Hell no. sentencing. We almost always request something called a pre-sentence hearing. Think of it, I tell people like a mini trial on the issue of what that sentence is going to be. Sometimes you get a stipulated sentence and everybody knows what the sentence is going to be. Okay, fine. That's a relatively easy one unless you think the judge is going to reject the plea, which it doesn't happen very often. But in most cases in that phase three, there's a range, right? So you took a deal. There's the worst thing the judge can do, the best thing the judge can do, and things in between. There's a lot of play there too. And I like to tell people, I make a football analogy here, it's kind of like when the running back gets the ball and he fights for every inch, right? Shucking and jiving and pushing and spinning and this and that and, and then holding the ball out to try to get every last inch. That's how we look at sentencing. Yeah, I remember talking to that. You saying that rem reminds me of a conversation I had with a prosecutor once where it was not a stipulated sentence, but the range of jail was relatively low compared to some other cases we've had. And I set it for a pre-sentence uh, hearing, and the range was anywhere between six months to eight months of jail. And so I set it for a full-blown two and a half hours on the court calendar sentencing hearing where I was going to bring in numerous character witnesses and experts and everything like that to fight for the six months. The prosecutor contacted me and said, really? You're setting it for a two and a half hour hearing on the court when all we're quabbling about is two months? And I said, you sound like somebody who's never spent an hour in custody before because I guarantee you that means something to my client. I'm going to fight for every inch. Yes, sorry to inconvenience you, prosecutor, but we're setting it for two and a half hours, I'm making my case. Look, if the range was your the defendant is going to do one day in jail or two days in right. jail, <laughs> I would fight just as hard whether it was a range of you know one year to twenty years because that extra day is a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd bring in witnesses, we'd bring in experts, we'd make big arguments, we'll take up the full day in court if we can to make that argument. And you know, the good news here, and and we're probably straying a little too far from this video, but just make this point. Sometimes you can get back in chambers and have a little informal discussion with the judge. That's a huge subject. Save it. All right. Let's save right. it when we get to that. All I, right. I love getting back in chambers know, and having I those know. conversations with the judge, but that is such a giant uh, can of worms. There's so much to talk about in all this Table stuff. it for now. Let's get back to step one. Okay, So today enough. we're talking about release. So we're going to assume that our viewers have maybe seen the previous episodes, particularly the one about uh, pre-trial, right? right? We've talked before at length about what happens before a case is charged and what a good seasoned criminal defense attorney can do to put you in a better position for the case. But specifically today, we'll talk about release. So now let's assume there's a charge. Now, one of a couple of things is going to happen. One thing that they could do is they could send you a summons that has an initial appearance date. Sometimes it's called an arraignment. Sometimes it's called an initial appearance hearing. Sometimes it's called a pretrial conference. But bottom line is a summons is where they actually send you a notice saying, you are charged with a crime. Here's your court date. We'll see you then. The other thing that they could do, a little bit more dramatic, is they could issue an arrest warrant and mm -hmm. they can send law enforcement out to find you, either at your home or your work or some other place, slap the cuffs on you and take you by force into custody. Now, if they go that route, they're going to have to set an initial appearance pretty soon. It varies per jurisdiction here in Arizona. They got to put you in front of a judge within 24 hours. But the point is you're going to get a hearing pretty quick if they go that route. If you get that summons that says, hey, you've been charged and you are to appear in court on such and such a day, that's a really good sign. Because nine times out of 10, if you walk into court for the hearing, for the judge to decide the question of release, 
you know, the question of whether you're a flight risk is pretty much resolved, right? Because, you know, that's one of the things the judge is going to think about. Is this guy going to come back for trial? Well, look, judge, you just told him what the charges are, and he just walked into court knowing what the charges are. Having an attorney who explained the charges to him, there's a pretty good chance flight risk isn't going to be a problem. So although it's not a guarantee, and I have had prosecutors argue for the person who just walked into court to be taken into custody. They're a flight risk, Judge. We want him <laughs> taken into custody right now. I remember you and I had a case one time where a guy yeah. drove across yeah. the entire continental United States from the East Coast to Arizona, and the prosecutor still got up and said, he's a giant flight risk, Judge. We should take him into custody right now. I, I couldn't believe that one. That was amazing. So it's not a guarantee which is why I say 9 out of 10. It's probably closer to 99 out of 100, really. But that point you just brought up, though, about a flight risk, we should talk about the things that a judge considers in ways when they're making the determination of release. Yeah, so um, at that hearing, the judge is going to come out on the bench, and what's the, the, several things are in the judge's mind, okay? And while this isn't an official factor, I think the overview here is, the judge is thinking, if I let this person out of custody, am I going to look bad? Mm -hmm. Is this person going to commit a new crime? And someone in the press is going to call me and say, why did this judge, who might be an elected judge, who might need to be reelected at some point, hey, judge, why did you let this horrible person out of custody on such a low bond or no bond, and now they've gone and done some terrible thing? I want to interject here real quick. This is not the standard judges no. should be using. You guys are getting a taste right now of the practical, real-world considerations that perhaps some judges have. But the standard in the law doesn't say the judge is to impose the release conditions most likely to make the judge look good or avoid looking bad. But this is an inside baseball kind of there a show. There you go, guys. <laughs> this is inside baseball. So this is what we, when we know that, right? So we want to make that judge comfortable. Hey, judge, we got no problems here. This person's not likely. I mean, the, the two big things, right? Right? Flight risk. What are the chances this person's going to flee the jurisdiction? Well, if they showed up in response to a summons, we got a very strong argument here. It's almost not even worth talking about it. But if they were arrested, you got a big case here. And there are many different things that a judge will look at on this point. And the number one thing is what we call ties to the community. Mm -hmm. Has the person been living in the community for 20 years? Do they have three kids who are locally going to school? Are they involved in a local church or other events? They have a job here. Do they own property here? Or are they, they more of a vagrant passing through town kind yeah, of thing or it, bouncing from place to place? No ties to keep them here. Is the person visiting from some distant part of the world? I mean, that makes a big difference because the judge is thinking, if I let this person out of custody, they're going to be gone. And the chances we get this person back are really slim. And so the flight risk is really, really important information. So this is, again, and you'll see, if you look at that emergency contact form, there are a lot of questions that are calculated to help us make that argument that this person has strong ties to the community. Sometimes these prosecutors will even get crazy with their flight risk arguments and say things like, yeah, we've uh, we've done research on this person. We found that he has access to boats and planes yeah. and all kinds of other things. And maybe he has his pilot's license or his boating license. Maybe he uh, has family in Mexico or some other country judge. And so we, the state, think that he's more of a flight risk than usual because of that. So we need to be prepared to rebut all such arguments. Yeah, these are the arguments that come up. It's really common in a federal case where... <laughs> We may suggest surrendering the person's passport, right? Mm -hmm. Because if the court's holding the passport or a probation department's holding the passport, it's going to be very difficult for this person to travel out of the country. So that sometimes can be sort of the tipping point. There are many other things that uh, the judge will consider. If there's a victim in the case, which means it's not a victimless crime, uh, say it's a real crime, what are the views of the victim? Mm -hmm. And so that can be anywhere on a spectrum from, hey, you know, uh, the prosecutor says, judge, we contacted the victim. We need haven't heard any response to victim doesn't take a position to victim is really scared of this person and wants this person held in custody and very strongly feels that the person should not be released to those kinds of things. Let me put a bookmark on this point because we're going to keep coming back to this over and over and over again. The views of the victim, the state's responsibility to the victim. Uh, most states have some kind of form, whether in their constitution or in statutory law, some kind of form of essentially a victim's bill of rights, you can think of it as. In other words, 
certain things that the state has to respect and the prosecutors have to fulfill with respect to a victim in the case. And one of those things is a victim in almost all states has the right to be contacted and informed of all proceedings that happen in a case and to be asked about what is their opinion about it and be invited to court to speak to the judge directly or to give a written statement, for example, to the prosecutor to read. So that begins. I wanted to put that bookmark because you're going to be hearing us talk about this again when we're talking about other videos and other steps of this process. But it really does begin right here where they at that very first hearing, the victim will be consulted. Yeah. And life can get tough at this point because other lawyers do what we do, which is representing victims sometimes. Mm -hmm. And when we represent a victim, we come to court at that release hearing and pound the table and make the case that, no, this person should not be released. So not only does the victim have a right to come there and speak, but victim has a right to hire an attorney on their behalf to come there and speak. So you might be dealing with that as well. And, uh, you know, that can be a a two-sided sword as well, because if there's an attorney representing the victim, then it's easy to talk to the victim's lawyer, maybe try to negotiate something in Mm -hmm. advance, right? And this is, again, it comes back to that emergency contact form. If we know how much of a bond somebody can put up, say, you know, $50,000 is a bond, we know that definitely can be posted. We could go to the victim's attorney and say, hey, look, I know the victim wants this, that, and the next thing, and uh, what do you think about a bond at, you know, 25? And they say, now, how about uh, 75? And we say, what about 40? Okay, deal. Or at least we know you're getting out. Yeah, I think we mentioned that in our pretrial video. All we're about to say about the initial appearance hearing and the fact that it's kind of scrappy and we're going back and forth about release conditions, we can make that all moot and we can make it much less dramatic, which oftentimes our client prefers. They like to know when they're walking into court that they're walking out again for sure. We can make this all moot by just making a, a stipulated deal with the prosecutor ahead of time. But back to the factors that the judge considers. So we have the, uh, ties to the community. We have the views of the victim if there is a victim in the case. There's also another factor, which is, is this person a danger to the community? The danger to the community can be a big one. And obviously the big point here are priors, right? Does the person have a bunch of priors? Are they dangerous priors? The worst prior you can have in a case in almost any hearing like this is a failure to appear. Right. Strangely enough. Not a very serious crime. It's usually a misdemeanor or something like that. Yeah, but if they got prior failures to appear, man, that prosecutor is going to be hopping up and down and say, Judge, here's what happened in a previous case. There was a hearing that was set and the person didn't appear and they got charged and convicted of essentially knowingly failing to appear and that's a big strike against you now sometimes there's arguments right you can come in and client will say well i didn't have notice i didn't know or there was some emergency or you can try to mitigate that but that's the kind of thing you need to know in advance which is again worst thing that can happen to us is to show up in court and learn about it for the first time yeah you do not want your attorney i mean the state's going to have your criminal record the judge is going to have it in front of them you don't want the only person in the room to not know that be your attorney yeah, and so this sort of blends into something that bugs me about these hearings more than any other aspect of this kind of a hearing, which is really, it's part of the danger to the community analysis, but it's the nature and circumstances of the offense and the weight for the judge to give this. To me, there's really no way to square this with a presumption of innocence. That's right, yep. I just, it's always bothered me since day one when I started practicing law. On one hand, we have this very strong presumption of innocence. You are presumed to be innocent. On the other hand, the judge reads a little short summary of the cases. These are really bad facts. You know, this is a very serious crime, sir. And I think you're a danger to the community. And I, I want to stand up and say, well, hold on a second, judge. Are you The facts you just read are allegations. They're not proven. And my client is presumed to be innocent. You, why are you even putting weight on these kinds of facts. And I frankly never had a satisfactory answer on this. That's right. And prosecutors will stand up and do this all the time. Judge, the reason why you should hold them on a $1 million bond is because the allegations are very serious. Yeah, here, Judge. right. It's a murder. It's a murder charge, especially if we're bringing self-defense. You know, that's sort of an interesting thing, too, because we're now we're debating the case. 
And we're not supposed to be doing that. He's presumed innocent of this charge. The judge really should be making a decision that doesn't include the current charges because that requires the judge to make decisions. Now, they're going to say, okay, uh, the presumption of innocence is at trial and we can use the same, essentially uh, presume that you're guilty for purposes of the release hearings. I, I, it's really not compatible with a presumption of innocence. I also say, especially for people who are listening to this video or watching this video right now because they're thinking, man, I don't want to be, you know, held just because I'm charged. That's terrible. It feels wrong. Yeah, but on the other side of the equation, there's so much noise right now. People upset with judges letting people out on bond who are then going to commit other crimes. Okay, we can't really have it both ways, right? Either you're presumed innocent and you should be... Either we're serious out. about this whole presumption of innocence thing in this country or we're not. Yeah, the way to fix this, in my view, just as a little segue, you got to punish the people when they're actually convicted of real crimes. Real crimes include things like shoplifting, breaking windows, theft of places like Sam's Club and Costco and Walmart, these kinds of places. Those people need to be prosecuted, and if they're convicted, they need to be punished. That's where you deal with people like this, not next time they're arrested and say no bond for people who are charged with crimes. Is that really a position we want to be taking as Americans? What we're really saying here, when you argue the judge shouldn't release somebody, they should not release them on bond, what you're saying is, I want to delete the presumption of innocence from American jurisprudence. Right. There, there are a lot of other arguable factors, too, that we hear from the state when it comes to danger to the community. Uh, you mentioned priors. If somebody's charged with a cr crime of violence and they have numerous violent priors, they will definitely make that, and the judge will definitely consider that. Also, uh, whether they have gang affiliations is often brought up. Um, whether, uh, if it's a victim crime, whether the same victim or similar circumstances were involved. So these things are all used by the yep. uh, judge to say, oh yeah, or by the prosecutor, rather, to argue this guy's a danger to the community judge. So independent argument from the flight risk issue. If you release him out, there's just a higher chance that he's going to go out and hurt somebody. And how the judge, as you mentioned earlier, how the judge may interpret that as by saying, oh, okay, there's a higher chance I'm going to look bad if I yeah. release this person out into the community. Other things we look for, if we've got evidence that the person is not under the influence of drugs, right? If a judge thinks this person's addicted to meth, the judge is going to think the chances of this person getting released and committing future crimes are really high. Mm -hmm. So if you've got something, maybe you were working on the case in the pre-charge phase and you've got a succession of negative drug tests, this could be something really good. Or an inpatient uh, uh, check-in yep. at, a, at a hospital yep. or something like that. Something showing that they have taken proactive steps to stay clean. And then something else that I think can really sway a judge. If you've got somebody and they're out in the community and they're working a job, they're full-time employed. And you get a letter from the supervisor who says, look, if this guy stops coming to work, we got to fire him. We can't, we cannot hold his job. That can be strong information too. So sometimes, you know, I'll tell people if we've got time, make sure you're working full-time. Can you get two jobs? Work two jobs. Can you get yourself enrolled in school, right? Because we want to make the argument, not just at the release hearing, but also at a sentencing, right? If the judge is making decisions that this person is now acting as a good citizen and why upset the apple card and, and keep this person in custody, cause them to lose their job, wife may not be able to support everything, kids could lose the house, they're on welfare. You can see this sort of chain of an argument here you can make. So essentially you got to be creative and you really want to make it hard for that judge to say, I want this person to stay in custody. That's right. And every jurisdiction has a different legal standard that the judge is supposed to follow. I really like the way that Arizona's is worded. The judge is required, and we've said this directly to the judge before, yeah. judge, you are required today to to give the least onerous release conditions that this court can possibly give in order to secure my client's presence at yeah. future court dates. It's so succinct. Yeah, the, the language is to be reasonably assured of their appearance right. at trial. Look, there's no guarantee, right? Anybody can... You know, I also say, too, I've had very few clients who have ab actually absconded. You know, and again, this is in the thousands and thousands of cases, Many, most of them major felonies in my career. Very few who have actually absconded in of those... Hey, stop speaking, lawyer. What do you mean by absconded? They've taken off. They've <laughs> fled the jurisdiction. They've said, you know what? Thanks I'm for... not showing up. Yeah. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm done being prosecuted. See you later. Yeah, it happens sometimes. I can only think of one who didn't get brought back. 
Mm -hmm. And they will bring you back from a foreign country. If you think you're going to take off and go to Mexico, you know, of course, depending on the charge, right? If it's a misdemeanor, they're probably just going to put a warrant out for you. They may not even extradite you if they pick you up in another state. Mm -hmm. But if it's a serious charge, I have had people brought back from foreign countries on serious cases. It's just generally not a good idea to flee the jurisdiction if you get in. And you're going to get a new charge and you're going to get no benefits of any doubts going forward on anything. So that's what an initial appearance looks like. The judge weighs these different factors. Here's oral arguments from both sides. We have a chance to present evidence to the judge in order to bolster the reasons for the uh, more lenient release, perhaps, that we're looking for. And then at that point, the judge makes a decision. And as we mentioned, if you receive a summons, this is likely to take place in a courtroom at the court, right? But if you don't receive a summons and they choose to go the arrest route, then likely this hearing is going to take place in a jail. I think we should say a few words about uh, these release hearings in jails, which actually you and I are quite big fans of. Yeah, they're kind of fun, these night court type hearings. Yeah, yeah. We should mention they run in most jurisdictions, they run around the clock. Like in the big cities, yeah, for sure. They yeah. run them around the clock. Usually they'll set them every maybe three or four hours. 8 p.m., 11 p.m., 2 a.m. And it's night court, just like you see on TV, right? You usually get a fairly new judge who may be a pro tem, somebody that's not their full time gig. Because again, who wants to be the judge on at two o'clock in the morning? And then you'll get a prosecutor who might be sleeping in an office somewhere in the place. <laughs> is quiet. I have literally walked in on prosecutors sleeping. Me too. Yeah, me too. And uh, it's kind of a fun little hearing and they parade these people up. Most of them are still in street clothes. A lot of them are falling asleep. It's it's sort of a strange situation. There's You might be meeting with your client in the corner of some jail cell somewhere, quietly whispering. Again, this is what we want to avoid doing an interview right here, right right five minutes before the hearing. This is why the emergency contact form. But yeah, they're interesting hearings. Almost never is there going to be another defense attorney there. Usually they will put your case to the front. Some Times. In fact, I'd say oftentimes you can get that judge and that prosecutor together and have a little meeting back in chambers. You might be able to broker an agreement right there, which could make a lot of sense. Take mm-hmm. the pressure off. I tell my client all the time. I'm going to go in and speak with the judge and the prosecutor. If I come out of that thing with a smile on my face, you just keep your mouth shut. That means you're getting out. Yeah, these hearings are fun. I call them late-night freedom fights, and it is really fun to show up in that type of a setting where, frankly, nobody really expects that you're going to show up and really advocate for your client and send a message to the state from the very, very first encounter that you have with them on the case. We're not screwing around. We're here to fight. Yep. So if you do get released, of course, if you're not released, then okay, you're stuck in the jail and that's that. We can talk about to getting a review of that order. That doesn't mean you're going to be there necessarily for the rest of the case. Um, I definitely want to talk about modification of release conditions. You want to go there now? Well, I think it'd be good before we hop there to talk about um, what are release conditions. Like, Let's give some examples of what release conditions could be because the judge has a ton of different options. right? The judge's attitude here is, look, I could keep you in custody if I wanted to. I'm letting you out. There's a lot of strings attached. I'm going to put any strings I want on there. If you don't want to comply with these strings, you know, you got a place to sleep right here. I, I remember judges saying, uh, you know, if, Mr. Victor, if your client doesn't want to come to court, I'll give him a free ride. I'm like, no, no, judge, it's okay. We're good. If, he, if he's having trouble finding somewhere to live, I got somewhere for him to live, counsel. The jail cell right there. Right here. Life. Yeah. So that's the judge's attitude. So you better follow these release conditions. They always are going to have the same first release condition. Don't commit any new crimes. If you commit any new crimes when you're released, that's almost always what we call a term one violation. This is a real pain in the neck because now you're it, it makes it hard to fight this, right? Yeah, we use the same terminology, by the way, for probation violations yes. if a new crime is is committed. Yeah, and this can be hard, right? Because it can be difficult. Now you're in a position where you want to make statements to say, no, this didn't happen, or here's our excuse or reason or defense, but you're not yet charged, and you might get charged, and so you don't want to make any statements that can definitely be used against you. So if you get charged with a new crime while you're on release, you are definitely going to have problems with that release being revoked. All right, I'm going to start kind of burning through some of this long list of release condition possibilities that a judge, after hearing the arguments from both sides may institute. So the most lenient one that the judge can do is something called OR release. It means you're released on your own recognizance. That just means 
you're promising to appear at all future court dates. And as long as you do that, there's not going to be any other release conditions. Generally, that's the best. If we can get OR released, that's what that's we want. That's the gold argue standard. For. That's what we want right there. You're just let out. Here's your new date. We'll see you then. Then there's a little step up from that in terms of supervision. Maybe the judge, maybe it's a type of crime where the judge doesn't totally trust uh, OR, or maybe wants a few different conditions, additional conditions imposed, but he doesn't want to hold you in custody. So they might release you to something that's often uh, called pretrial services. Pretrial services is basically there's a department within usually probation departments and their job is to make sure that people who are currently charged with crimes show up to court, check in every now and then, and then they have the right sometimes, depending on the charges, to put some additional things in, into yeah, play. We should probably back up just a tad too because just because you're released to OR doesn't mean there are no other conditions, right? There are going to be some standard conditions like we talked about don't commit any new crimes. And they want that there because then you're not just punished with a new crime. Now you've also violated your release conditions. Other things that are almost standard, don't leave the jurisdiction. Right. Without uh, permission. Yeah, without permission. And the jurisdiction could be don't leave the city, don't leave the county, don't leave the state. You could get don't leave the country. I have had people with permission to leave the country even on sure. federal cases. And what how you get permission is through your lawyer. Your lawyer has to file something generally with the court and have the judge make the determination you're allowed to leave. Yeah, motion to modify release conditions really Motion common. to allow travel things like yes that. And, and just on those it's very common to first try to talk the prosecutor into it and sometimes you can right? if the person's been released for a little while and there's no problems and you got a good reason prosecutor say I don't oppose that it's almost guaranteed to happen at that point but you're going to get conditions like don't use any drugs don't use any illegal drugs I think it's important to note that marijuana is still illegal federally so people can get confused on this if you're on a federal crime and you get a release one of those terms from the federal judge or mag federal magistrate judge is going to be don't use drugs including marijuana even if you got a medical marijuana card or marijuana is legal in your state that's a state issue and it definitely will violate your federal release conditions if you smoke marijuana almost always you'll get you know report to an officer or something like that kind of to check in so they know who you are um, we talked about don't leave the jurisdiction, don't change your residence without prior approval. If this is where you live, we want to know where you live. Right. So you got to continue to live at this residence. Sometimes there'll be a search of the residence where you have to agree to let a probation officer check. You know, if you put the, your residence down as some crack house down the street, the probation officer, if there's one, uh, or pretrial services officer, we would call at this point, because you're not on probation, you're on pretrial release. They go out and check out the place, and they're like, nah, this isn't an approved residence, you're out. Sometimes they'll say you are to keep your job, you're supposed to stay employed, that's really common. Sometimes they will say don't associate either with a co-defendant on the case or with anybody who's got a criminal conviction. So if you've got a buddy and he's got a felony on his record, you can't talk to that person. That's a condition of your release. I want to return to that point that you just made about co-defendant contact, but we'll get yep, there. Yep. Oftentimes, if you get arrested for something, sometimes it's even broader, police contact, right? You get pulled over for speeding and a police officer is you know, giving you a warning. Technically, you got to report yeah, that. Yeah, they may say within 72 hours of any police contact, you better let us know. And then really common, no guns. Yeah. Now, this is one of those things that's being challenged, right? Because under the Bruin standard, it's not so clear that this kind of a restriction was part of our nation's history and traditions. When you're accused of a crime and presumed innocent, you're not allowed to defend yourself. Doesn't seem consistent with... Uh, yeah, but, it, but they're pretty standard conditions of release, both for state and federal, especially on a felony case, which is, you sorry, you can't have guns. Not just guns, any kind of a weapon that's for defense, no nunchucks, no uh, tasers, none of that stuff. And so, uh, you know, if you could say, look, I'm not willing to abide by that, the judge could say, okay, well, you stay in custody. So those are some common things, and you were talking about pretrial yeah, services. Yeah, I want to return to pretrial services. Yeah. So pretrial services is put in place, and oftentimes when they want to add a little bit more in terms of your supervision, and oftentimes what's required for pretrial services, remember this is somebody from the probation office usually, they want you to check in. They'll say, we want you to check in once a week, twice a week, once a month. They'll kind of, they'll, oftentimes they'll tailor it to your current uh, situation and felony level and, and, and things like 
like that. But then they'll also impose some other things depending on the crime sometimes. For example, a very standard one uh, is if you're charged with driving under the influence, say aggravated driving under the influence or something like that, they may impose alcohol testing. Let's say you're charged with a drug offense. Yeah, hey, with a no alcohol provision. Yeah. Right, right. And we're going to alcohol test you at random. Yeah. Uh, you're charged with a drug offense, same thing. They yep. may say, hey, you got to call in uh, every morning. you got to call in. Uh, and uh, if it's your time to go drop a UA, uh, you got to go down and drop a UA. And if it comes back dirty, you're in violation. Or, we can take you back into yeah, custody. Or you fail to show for the test. I mean, that's your requirement. You're agreeing to They make you sign that. We should mention, too, there are written conditions here when you get released, especially if you're in custody. Uh, normally what will happen is the court clerk will come out and say, here you go. Here are your written release conditions. Lots of times the judge will read these into the record, at least some of the special ones. If the judge can tailor these any way the judge wants, and then you'll sign them. So you have in writing a copy of these are your conditions so there's no confusion that you knew what they were. I want to bust through a couple more. Uh, the judge may require you to wear an ankle monitor. Maybe they, there's an argument that you might be a flight risk in the jurisdiction, or maybe, say, in the case of a victim crime, they want to assure that you're not going near the alleged victim's residence, but the judge isn't quite Right there where they want to uh, keep you in custody or maybe you've posted a bond and they say if you're released you got to get an ankle monitor they could very well do that and along those same lines less extreme but uh, same kind of principles here they may impose a curfew they may say all right you're allowed to leave the house go to work and everything like that but uh, you have to use a special app a gps tracker on your phone or something like that it used to be a landline right that you would have to get installed in your house we've kind of moved the technology in most jurisdictions have moved past that but they check up on you to make sure you're back in your house at 6 p.m. or something like that. And you could be found in violation if you break that. Yeah, I like to tell people that if you're released to pretrial services, think of it as being on probation before any conviction, right? Normally, you, you can't be on probation unless you're convicted of a crime. But pretrial services, it looks and smells and quacks a lot like probation. So that's essentially what you're on. And then I want to talk about two different types of no contact that could be ordered by the court. Uh, in a victim crime, they're almost always going to say no contact with the victim. Say it's a domestic violence mm -hmm. offense or maybe even a shooting where the person survived. Don't have contact with the victim. There's concerns about, yep. you know, witness tampering and intimidation and you better not show up to court. You know, who, who knows what they're concerned about, but they will oftentimes impose those types of things. But then there's another type of no contact provision. And uh, it's kind of interesting because a lot of times in cases with multiple co-defendants, they'll say no talking to the co-defendants about the case outside of right. court. And oftentimes this can serve as a hindrance to what we're trying to accomplish in a case. Let's yeah. say that, for example, we want to work with another defendant and their attorney on kind of a joint defense. Well, these things can be modified by d joint defense agreements and motions to modify, which we're about to talk about. But uh, oftentimes they'll start with a blanket prohibition about contacting each other about the case. And also not to return to the scene is and can be yep, a, a, yep. a one as well. And you know, sometimes we may want to go out there to the scene with our client to say, okay, show us exactly what happened where. And like you said, Andy, these are actually pretty easy to modify. We, we file these all the time. Out Let's of talk office. about a motion yeah. to modify. What is a motion to modify release? Yeah, so a motion to modify is a when you file a motion what you're asking is for the court to do something hey judge i'm asking you to do something and so a motion to modify pretrial release uh, or release conditions is saying judge something about the release conditions we're asking you to change there could be all kinds of good reasons my client's hours of work changed and we need to change the home arrest provision or the curfew provision hey, he's done a good job out now and he doesn't need this ankle monitor anymore we want to sort of step down on that people don't like it as there's a charge you got to pay they can be kind of itchy and scratchy sometimes they go off when they shouldn't go off they don't maybe, work maybe right. this is a cyber crime or something like that a white collar crime of some sort where the court imposes no internet. Uh, you can't use the internet while you're on pretrial services. Somebody might be able to make a convincing argument. Look, judge, like if my, my client works online, he works from home, if he doesn't have the internet, he's going to lose his job. And so you should modify it. For or that something reason. can happen, right? There might be a death in the family and now client wants to go attend the funeral, the funeral in a different yeah. state. That's often granted, things like that. Uh, you know, the more trust you can build up with the court. Even sometimes in maybe less serious cases, your client just wants 
wants to go on vacation. Judge, my client has a Thanksgiving gathering in, you know, a different state with the family. And we are asking the court's permission. He just wanted to be as transparent as possible. Wouldn't even think about going without the court's permission. That can build some trust with the court. Yeah. And, you know, these get granted far more routinely if you can get the prosecutor on board. Mm -hmm. Right. So we never file one of these without talking to the prosecutor first. And, uh, you know, sometimes my argument to the prosecutor is, you know, you might build up a little good faith with my client. There might be some level of trust at some point for some reason. And the prosecutor might want to seem reasonable. That happens sometimes and say, okay, I don't think your guy's fleeing. Or sometimes they'll say, I'll give your guy an opportunity to screw the pooch. And that'll happen. And so, yeah, it's pretty common to try to get these changed. Another reason you might want to move to modify release conditions is the first judge at that initial appearance just was kind of out to lunch. And again, you know, you usually don't get the most experienced judges doing these types of hearings. And sometimes they're far too sort of conservative. They set the bond way too high. And we look at it and say, oh, that's too high for a case like this. And uh, they say, sorry, counsel, that's my decision, and that's the end of that. All right, well, when the case moves to the next level, usually you can bring a motion to modify that, and you get a new judge at a new level to sort of review the conditions that were set. And it's pretty common to get the more experienced judge to say, yeah, I think that was maybe a little too harsh. I'm going to lower the bond amount or something along those lines. And there are different legal standards that dictate this, right? Technically, uh, in a lot of jurisdictions, Arizona included, you have to show that there was a substantial change in circumstances from when that initial release conditions were set. But frankly, that substantial change could be judge that maybe that initial appearance judge didn't just just didn't have all the information and just didn't have everything that they needed to consider in order to make an informed opinion about the release conditions here. So um, there are different standards here. But the last thing that I think, so we've been kind of listing off things that uh, a judge can set as your release conditions. The last one I want to talk about is the big one, which is after all that, if after all the oral argument, the judge weighs everything and decides, you know, despite hearing all that, there is no combination of release conditions that I can give that would uh, secure the appearance of this defendant, I'm going to set a bond. I want to set some sort of a bond, and uh, we should talk about bond. We should talk about the different types of bond, and we should talk about bondsmen. So what happens when the judge sets a bond? Yeah, what the judge is essentially saying is, look, put some money up. And uh, there are different kinds of bonds. You can have a cash-only bond, which I think we shouldn't have. It just makes it harder to post the bond, which is, hey, if you can post this amount of cash and post it sometimes with the court, sometimes with the jail, then if you flee, we're taking the money. Yeah, you Sorry. probably heard us talk about this before, this issue of cash-only bonds. Uh, if you haven't, then review some of our other videos. But we're very opinionated about this. There's an argument that they should be unconstitutional, that they're inconsistent with a presumption of innocence. But I digress. Digress. Punishes okay. people who don't have the money to yep. put it up. That's it. Yep. It takes the possibility of a bondsman usually out of the equation. Sometimes they'll still put up a cash only bond. They may want 20, 25 percent. Yeah, sorry, as you're their on fee. you're on debtor's confinement, yeah. basically. We're right. holding you in custody through no fault of your own, other than you just don't have the resources to put Yeah, then there's the secured bond, which is usually the bondsman's gonna put up a essentially a piece of paper that says, Hey, if the defendant flees, I'll I'm good for it, I'll pay for it. And uh, the bondsman's going to want usually about 10% of the total amount of the bond as a fee and a lien on something. So that bondsman's not dumb. That bondsman says, hey, if I got to put up the money for this bond, I'm not going to be out the money. I'm going after you. I'm selling your house. I'm selling your car, your jewelry, whatever. I'm in business. I'm trying to make money. I'm not trying to lose money because your dumb ass fled the jurisdiction. So those are the different kinds of bonds, how high they are. And of course, you know, in in some cases, there's no bond at all. And this is really common. Common in the federal court. Sorry, you're detained. You're detained. There is yeah. no bond, no amount you can put up. We're not letting you out of custody. I think this is pretty outrageous. If to say you're detained, there's no amount of anything that will allow us to let you out. And yet you're still presumed innocent. Don't think for a second anybody here thinks you're guilty. I'm glad you brought up the federal system because it's really important to have a seasoned defense attorney who does both state and yeah. federal because the rules vary so much yeah. between the two. Yeah. Like, for example, under certain states, 
states, there's ways they can actually hold you non-bondable. Yes. Like, for example, if you're on probation at the time, there's an option. If it's an inherently dangerous felony in some You committed a felony while you were on release for another felony. Yeah, I mean, there there are certain ways, like, we we consider these so serious, and the presumption needs to be great, and there's ways to challenge that and everything like that. But yeah, it's really important to know the nuances of this. Yeah, the real serious crimes, a lot of times the judge will just hold you non-bondable. Yeah. Sorry. You're entitled to a hearing on all this stuff, but doesn't mean you're going to win the hearing. And and the way it shakes out, if the crime alleged is really, really bad, you're going to be held either on some crazy, hugely high bond or no bond at all. That can be very difficult. And there's no, in my opinion, there's no way to square that with the presumption of innocence. So now the judge has set your release condition. It's, it's something from the menu of all the different uh, variations that we just laid out. And the case is now proceeding along and it goes to the next video we're going to make, which is just the regular flow of the case, the procedure. But the last thing I want to talk about in this video briefly is what happens if you violate your release conditions? Whew, that's always a bad scene, right? Yes. It's horrible to get that call that yes. uh, from the prosecutor, hey, you know, we're picking your guy up or we've picked your guy up because your guy's alleged to have violated. Look, this is an important enough change in status, right? You're out and now they're trying to bring you back in saying you violated. You are definitely entitled to a hearing on this. But it's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a much lower standard. Yeah, so lots of times the, the person will be just arrested, taken into custody, and then we'll set a hearing, and the evidence will be brought about why the person violated. The judge could still find the person violated, but I'm going to put you back out on release again. Maybe with a few extra conditions, maybe with more intensive surveillance, a few yeah, extra things. Yeah, really like common. That. So the judge can add a few things, or the judge can say, sorry, you blew it. You blew it. I gave you your chance. You're going back in. Yeah, so you got to be very, very careful, which is why when you get Get those conditions of release. You really should read them carefully. Hold on to them. If there's something you think's just unpalatable there, you got to get your defense attorney to Sit litigate that. Sit down with your defense attorney and make sure you understand each and every aspect because a lot of people don't speak legalese and sometimes these courts don't put it in normal plain talk of what this means, what this condition means, what this condition means. Does it include that? So you got to, ha- I always have a sit down with my clients right at the beginning of the case saying, all right, let's go through your release conditions and make sure you don't violate it. Final little inside baseball tip here. It's not that uncommon either for us to go to the prosecutor and say, hey, we're going to file a motion to modify release conditions and have the prosecutor say, look, I'm going to offer you a deal. I don't want you to file that motion to modify release conditions. If the guy serves another, you know, name it 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, I'll just give you, you know, like a time served, something like that. But if you file, you make me argue this, then I'm not going to give you that deal. So there can be some negotiations in the kind of the back room there where we go back to the client and say, look, we could file this, but here's what it's going to cause the prosecutor to do and we could get this thing wrapped up if you just stay in another two weeks and be done look making the sausage uh, back in the uh in the back room there is a big part of what we criminal defense lawyers do yeah most important things in a case don't occur in the courtroom they that's occur, right they occur between the parties and that's chambers right. things like that but i have one more little piece of insider baseball that i want to share which i think is really really important for defendants to understand whenever i'm arguing to get uh, my client out of custody or keep them out of custody uh, on release, I always tell them, look, there are uh, selfish reasons why I want you out of custody as your defense attorney. Yes, I want you to be comfortable and sleep in your own bed and have a hot meal and take a shower in your own home. I'm sure you'd prefer that. But in terms of your legal defense, there are advantages to this. Like, for example, if we end up sometime down the line at a sentencing and my client has perfectly behaved himself, we had maybe a big fight in the beginning where the prosecutor's like, Judge, you got to worry about this guy. You got to take yeah. him into custody. You got to worry about him. He's a flight risk, he's a danger. And then I manage to keep him out, and he does a great job on pretrial services. At the sentencing, we might be arguing whether this person needs to go to prison or whether they're going to be able to be compliant with probation. And what takes the wind out of the prosecutor's argument faster than anything that they need to go to prison, they're not going to be a good candidate for probation? Judge, he's been out this entire time with perfect compliance on pretrial services. There ain't no argument he wouldn't be successful on probation. No, it's a great point. I'll just add to that. Sometimes the reverse is true, where we say, you know what, there's going to be this argument at sentencing and we kind of look if you stay in another 30 days we've got a good argument a better argument 
judge, he's served enough time. Right. He doesn't need to go to prison. And so we, we want to, so we're always thinking, and this is, again. And back, that's not what I thought you were going to say yeah. when you said the reverse is true. What I thought you were going to say is if you make that oh, argument yes. and you get your client out over the objection of the state and then your client blows yes, it that's a good point by too. violating, that can blow up in your face yes. in sentencing. There you go, judge, says the prosecutor. There you go. We gave him a chance. You gave him a yeah. chance. We told you not to, and he screwed it sometimes, up. We got to send him to prison. Sometimes we have that conversation with the defendant. Look, dude, if we get you released and you screw it up, you're going to put yourself in a worse position. And sometimes they say, look, I don't really have a place to live. I am addicted to meth. I don't have a job. I'm probably going to get in trouble. You are. You might actually be better sitting stay right and there. start racking up your time right yeah, so, now. Again, every case is different. This is why you really you need a customized defense on your case because every person is different. The, every The facts are different. And people say, Mark, how do you do on these kinds of cases? I say, there aren't these kinds of cases. Every case is unique, right? There's a different defendant and a different set of facts, and you really need a customized defense. Even with the same case, same defendant, different prosecutors, right. different results, different judges, different results. So there's a lot to talk about. This is why we love doing what we do. That was a whole lot of information about release, and I'm sure we probably forgot a million things, but I like this approach that we're taking, which is just kind of hit the major points, throw as much as we can, throw some insider tips along the way. I think that's what we're going to try to continue to do with this series. And then the next time we meet, we're going to talk about, okay, now release conditions have been determined. What's the flow of a case yeah. look like? And we're going to talk about it in multiple contexts, even all the way down to courts of limited jurisdiction, like misdemeanor courts, city courts, justice courts, yeah. state superior courts, felony courts, and even all the way up to federal. We're going to talk about all kinds of different stuff, how a case flows. Yeah. I mean, if you want to know the inside baseball of how to defend a criminal case and what criminal defense lawyers do, and maybe measure it, and maybe you're going through one of these right now, this would be a great series of videos to watch to just say, you know, maybe I should ask my criminal defense lawyer, hey, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? These are just, and of course, we can't get to every possible, you know, scenario in these videos, but we're trying to give you a deep dive into how you do a case, what happens behind the scenes, just from our experience on doing these. All right, everybody. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it, subscribe to it, and leave us a comment down below. Maybe we missed the question that you had in your mind when you clicked on the video. No worries. Throw it down below, and we'll try to get it responded to. Check out attorneysonretainer.us to learn all about our self-defense program and have a criminal defense attorney on your side 24-7, 365. And to learn more about our law firm, attorneysforfreedom.com. Learn about our philosophy and how we defend people. Until next time, this has been Attorney Andy Markentil and Attorney Mark J. Victor. Peace. Peace.